right, so this morning, um, as I mentioned, Pastor Angel and his family, they are out of town. So um, I'll be uh, teaching for him this morning. And um, we will be in the book of Daniel this morning, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. And we will be in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And the title of the message this morning is um, No Compromise. No Compromise, Daniel chapter 1. So, you know, with everything that's happening in the world right now, everything that's happening in our nation at this time, um, this particular portion of scripture has really been on my mind, been on my heart for the past several weeks. And um, in fact, I think it was about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to share a little bit from Daniel chapter 1 at a youth conference up in, um, in New Mexico. So uh, this has really been on my mind, has really been on my heart. And um, this morning, the Lord has put a couple of things on my heart to share uh, with you all regarding um, Daniel um, chapter 1 here. Now, the book of Daniel shares with us uh, some events that occurred during a time when um, the Jewish people were held captive. They were in captivity. And also, um, it shares with us visions and revelations and, um, and prophecies that the Lord has given to Daniel or had given to Daniel. And most scholars agree that the book of Daniel was written between the 6th century and the 2nd century um, B.C. Now, regarding Daniel, the prophet Daniel, somebody once wrote, regarding Daniel, they wrote, I wish to stress that none of the prophets has so clearly spoken concerning Christ as has this prophet Daniel. For not only did he assert that he would come, a prediction common to the other prophets as well, but also he set forth the very time at which he would come. Moreover, he went through the various kings in order, stated the actual number of years involved, and announced beforehand the clearest signs of events to come. So when you think about the book of Daniel, another, another thing to mention here is that the book of Daniel is commonly studied along with the book of Revelation. Those two together, when you study those together, it's, it's, it's a good thing because their prophecies regarding the end times um, they fit very nicely um, together. Okay, so um, typically the idea is that you would study the book of Daniel and then you would also study the book of Revelation um, together because there's cohesiveness when it comes to the Word of God, right? Everything is needed. It's not just the Old Testament and the, just the New Testament. It's all pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything in the Word of God will point to Jesus Christ. So in addition to all these things that the book of Daniel brings us, um, there are also some really great lessons that we can learn from Daniel. And this morning, we're going to talk about a time when Daniel and his friends, they were put in a very difficult situation. And in that situation, they had to figure out whether they were going to be obedient to God or be obedient to a man or to a king. And the question becomes, are they going to compromise their faith for a king? And I think for many of us in this room, there have been maybe some situations or times in your life where you had to choose between being faithful and obedient and not compromise and choose the Lord over a man or over a leader or over the world, whatever it is. And maybe you're going through a season right now when you think about the state of our world and the state of our nation, um, the state of humanity in general. You know, are we being faithful to the Lord? Are we being faithful to the temporariness of this world. Now, in the case of Daniel and his friends, they actually chose to be obedient to God. And as a result of this, their obedience, their lack of compromise, actually protected them and blessed them. And what we'll learn is that in our lives, when we are obedient to the Lord, when we trust the Lord and we don't compromise, the Lord too is, is, going, to, um, is going to bless us. So before we actually look at the Word of God together, we're going to break this down into a couple of different sections. Let me go ahead and pray one more time, and then we'll read the Word of God together. Well, Lord, we thank you once again for this time, Lord, and, and for your Word, and the fact that your Word is inerrant, Lord God. You inspired it. You wrote it through many um, individuals, and we pray that you just continue 
to um, work through your word, Lord God. And this morning, help us to learn the things you desire us to learn. Fill us, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us to have understanding that your word would take root in our lives and that it would shape us and mold us. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is actually in the first two verses here of Daniel chapter 1. And what we're going to see here is that King Nebuchadnezzar, he conquers Jerusalem. Uh, So it says here in verse 1, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. All right, so what we see here in these first two verses is that Daniel is writing about a time when Judah, um, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, became captive. They became sieged under King Nebuchadnezzar, who was this evil ruler of Babylon, okay? And Judah, remember, is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and Judah was a descendant. I believe it was like the fourth son born to Jacob and to, um, and to uh, Leah. And um, the timing here, one thing I want to clarify about the timing here, is notice that it says, in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, It's saying that King Nebuchadnezzar came and laid siege on Judah. Now, the timing here is not contradicting the timing that we read about, for example, like in the book of Jeremiah. So here in Daniel, it says once again that this happened in the third year of King Jehoiakim. In Jeremiah, it says that this occurred during the fourth year of King Jehoiakim. But what we can, um, to clarify this, Daniel, scholars believe Daniel was likely using the Babylonian system of counting, which did not count a king's year of accession, um, while Jeremiah used the Israelite system of counting that actually included that year um, of accession. And this is probably why we see that difference in that, in that year there, but it's the same. It's the same period of time that's being spoken of here, as we also read there. For example, in the book of um, of Jeremiah, I believe it's like in the forty sixth chapter where it talks about that. So going back to King uh, to King Jehoiakim, um, this was an individual that was actually placed on the throne by Pharaoh of Egypt. Okay, and it's interesting because Jehoiakim. His name means Yahweh raises up. But in this particular case, he was not raised up by the Lord to the throne. It was by actually Pharaoh, this individual from Egypt. And we're going to see because of this, there are consequences to this, to this um, disobedience that, we've, that we see here in the land of Judah. But Nebuchadnezzar, this was the king of Babylon from about 605 BC to around 562 BC. Kind of estimated there. And Nebuchadnezzar served as God's instrument of judgment on Judah for its idolatry, um, its unfaithfulness, and its disobedience. And you can say they were kind of a part of the world system under, um, you know, being faithful to Egypt and to Pharaoh. And we'll talk a little bit about that right now. But if you remember in Jeremiah chapter 25, Um, verse 9, here it speaks regarding Nebuchadnezzar and how the Lord used this individual to bring judgment upon, um, upon Judah. So it says, I'm going to send for all the families of the north, this is the Lord's declaration, and send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land, against its residents, and against all these surrounding nations." And I will completely destroy them and make them an example of horror and scorn and ruins forever. So the Lord using Nebuchadnezzar as his instrument and as as his tool to bring judgment to these individuals. And when you think about Nebuchadnezzar, this was a brutal, powerful, ambitious leader or individual. Okay. And Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem 
because if you remember, Pharaoh of Egypt invaded Babylon, okay? And Jerusalem had been loyal to Pharaoh of Egypt. And the Bible tells us of two additional encounters that Jehoiakim would have with Nebuchadnezzar. This is the first that we're reading about this morning here in, in uh, Daniel chapter 1. But notice here that Daniel says that the Lord handed Jehoiakim over to Nebuchadnezzar. And we know this because, as we read in Jeremiah 25, the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar um, as his instrument to bring judgment upon them because of their idolatry and their unfaithfulness to the Lord. And notice that in these first two verses that Nebuchadnezzar took some vessels from the house of God. Okay, now Nebuchadnezzar didn't take everything. He took certain items. Um, some people suggest that the remaining stuff in the temple may have been hidden before he came or may have been sent to Babylon um, later. Uh, we really don't know. But what we know is that he took some of the vessels from the house of the Lord and took them um, to his gods. And this is the setting of, of what's to come for the remainder of this chapter. So this is kind of an unsettling time that Daniel and his friends are going to be finding themselves in. Very similar to what we see in our time right now. A very unsettling period. So in the next few verses, uh, actually just verse 3 and 4, what we're going to see here is that we are going to be introduced to Daniel and, um, and some of his friends. And the fact that these were young adults, they were young people. And we'll see this in the text. So it says, beginning in verse 3, it says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. So I'll stop there for now, and then I'll read this other section in just a little bit here. Um, so... You know, in addition to King Nebuchadnezzar taking, you know, the best from the temple, bringing it back to Babylon, he also ordered, as, as you notice here in the text, his chief eunuch or his official, um, Ashpenaz, to bring the best of the brightest of Jerusalem's young men um, to Babylon. These shining stars, you could call them, right? Like the future of, of Judah. So these individuals that were the best. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar um, asked his chief eunuch to do. And, you know, when you think about Nebuchadnezzar, this brutal leader, um, this was a guy who would take the best of everyone else and bring it onto himself. And I was thinking about this. Um, it, it's kind of like, let's say you're with your family and um, you buy a bucket of chicken from like KFC or something. It's like the original, right? The best one. Um, and then somebody just eats all the skin off the chicken and they just leave the meat and the bones behind, right? They took the best for themselves and left the rest for everybody else. Um, that's kind of like what Nebuchadnezzar would do. Or let's say you came in here and all the, the frosting was eaten off the donuts and all the jelly was sucked out of the donuts and all that was left behind was the bread, right? That's something that Nebuchadnezzar probably would do. Um, and what we see here once again is that he's choosing the best of these young men, taking these young men hostage, okay? You know, in a sense, doing this, reminding the people back in Jerusalem that they should not revolt against this new Babylonian rule. And if you look at that phrase there, young men, um, that can actually be translated as children or boys and probably refers to teenagers anywhere from 13 to 17 years of age, okay? So these were young people. These were teenagers. And um, we have some young people here in our church. Um, we have um, young people, obviously, in the world around us. So uh, what we're going to see is that the Lord's going to use these young people in a mighty way. And, you know, when you think about young people, teenagers, middle school, high school age, um, they're so important. They're so valuable to the Lord. But at the same time, they're just as valuable to the enemy. And when you think about the world right now, the enemy is after the young people. He's after everyone, of course. But I don't know. I, in my heart, I believe that the young people who are the next group of individuals to carry the torch of Christianity, the enemy is after them even more so. 
And that's why they're so valuable. They're so important. And God can use them in mighty ways. And like I said, we'll see this this morning. So if you're a young person and you don't think you're significant, you don't think you're valuable, you're very wrong. You're so valuable to God, but at the same time, you're valuable to the enemy. And you have to make sure that you choose. You choose the Lord. Team Jesus, because your value for him is going to allow you to do some wonderful things. And, um, and you're valuable to your families and to your friends and to everybody around you. But never forget that. Everyone is valuable. Um, and of course, right now we're talking about young people because of this reference here um, to Daniel and, um, and his friends. And, you know, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar knew how valuable these young men were. Um, because once again, they were the next generation of, um, of that region of Judah, right? And he, it, he wanted to indoctrinate them. It was urgent for him to, um, to change their views, to change their culture for his purpose, to use them for himself. And um, what we're going to see here once again is that um, he's going to have a hard time with Daniel and, and, and his friends. So notice here in the second part of verse 4, I think I read the first part of verse 4, um, and I'll read all the way to verse 7. What we're going to see here is that the king um, then orders some specific things to be done. And these things actually defy or they go against um, the Lord. So beginning in verse 4, the second part of verse 4, it says, He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judahites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, and Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Okay, so these young men that were to be brought from, um, from Judah, from, from Jerusalem, these bright men were to be trained for three years and probably to groom them, to get them ready for um, civil, civil service there with King Nebuchadnezzar. And notice here that the king controlled everything. He controlled what they ate. He controlled their education. And he even had their names changed, right? Their names were changed by that chief eunuch. And the purpose of controlling their food, the purposes of controlling their education and changing their names or their identities was to totally indoctrinate them, to brainwash them in a sense, um, to change these young men's hearts, to turn away from their Hebrew culture and from the Lord and to turn to the cultural rays of the Babylonians and to turn to their false gods. That's what was the purpose here of, um, of all of this change. And notice that these young men were to be trained in the Chaldean language and literature. And this would certainly turn them from their Hebrew culture and, um, and from the Lord as well. And notice that they also had a very strict diet, right? And, you know, when you think about those times, having the same food and having the same wine, um, that was prepared for the king and provisioned by the king was actually something that was very honorable. But in this case, um, not so honorable because the food and the wine, all these things, um, they went against the one and true king, which is um, the Lord. And then notice that Daniel and his friends, they initially had names that honored God. Okay. And then they were given names that honored false gods. So if you look at their Hebrew names, Daniel, for example, his name actually means God is my judge. Hananiah means beloved by the Lord. Uh, Mishael means who is as God. And Azariah means the Lord is my help. Okay, so those were their Hebrew names. And then they were given these new Babylonian names. So Daniel, remember in the text, it says, was to be named Belteshazzar, which means Baal's prince. Hananiah was given the name Shadrach, which means illumined by the sun god, or by sun god. Um, Mishael was given the name 
um, Meshach, which means who is like Venus, and Azariah was given the name Abednego, which means um, servant of Nego. So what we see here is that their names are changed from names that honored God to names that honored um, false gods and not the Most High. So putting this all together, what we see happening here is something that we see every single day as we go into the world. And it's obvious, as we've already mentioned, we're living in very difficult times right now. The world is a mess, isn't it? Um, we're living in very trying times for believers. And when you think about our schools, you think about our places of work, what you see on television, social media, Right now, the world around us is trying to indoctrinate, control, brainwash us on how we should live, how we should love, how we should do this, how we should do that. And the enemy uses these tools to make us turn from the ways of the Lord to turn to the ways of the world. And in fact, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, it talks about such times, times that we are living in now. It says there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, um, Paul writes, But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, um, slanders, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid um, these people. So there is a nice description of the last days and in, in days I believe we're living in right now. Very, very difficult times. And that's why, if you remember, for example, like in the book of Ephesians, or the letter to the Ephesians, rather, the Apostle Paul tells them there in chapter 5 to walk circumspectly, right? To walk carefully, redeeming the time, making the most of the time they have on this earth because the days are truly evil. And like I said, we're living in times that are truly evil. These are like the days of Noah. And um, if you remember, for example, in Genesis um, chapter 6, um, there Moses uh, records for us. Um, if you remember the days of Noah there, regarding this, it says, When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was deeply grieved. And when you think about the times we're living in, very similar, <clears throat> in my opinion, to the days of Noah. And I truly believe that the Lord is grieved with what he sees happening on the planet right now. Humankind, the divisiveness, everything. And that's why as believers in the world, not of the world, but in it, we have to hold fast to the Lord and to his word and be loyal to the Lord and not loyal to the world or loyal to compromise. And that takes work. That, that's something that can be very difficult, especially when the world around us is influencing us and, and telling us what to do. And when you think about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the situation that Daniel and his friends are in or facing, and the state of the world right now, this is exactly what the enemy does. Number one, the enemy leads us to identify with something in the world. And in the case of Daniel and his friends, their names were changed from these beautiful Hebrew names that honored God to these Babylonian names that helped them identify with that new culture. Secondly, the enemy feeds us what the world has to offer. And in the case of Daniel and his friends, remember that their diet was to be changed. Nebuchadnezzar was specific on what they could eat and what they could not eat. And Daniel and his friends changing their diet um, changed in accordance to the ways of that new Babylonian culture. And then thirdly, the enemy wants us to be educated in the ways of the world. And um, there's 
So first of all, there's nothing wrong with being educated, um, but using it for God's glory is the idea, right? You can have all the degrees in the world, but those are tools and instruments for the Lord's glory. But when you're educated in the ways of the world, to be like the world, that's a different thing. And Daniel and his friends, once again, were to be educated in the Chaldean language and in the Chaldean um, literature. So what we see here is the tactics of the enemy through King Nebuchadnezzar, and we see the tactics of the enemy in our world right now through different avenues. And the only way we can escape those tactics of the enemy is by what James tells us in James chapter 4, verse 7. It says there, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But it has to be in that order. We can't resist the devil first and then submit to God. We have to submit to God first. That way we have the ability to resist the devil. And then all these tactics can flee from us. And remember, we have all the tools and instruments we need to submit to God, right? We have the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. We have the word of God, right? We have the Bible. We have um, prayer. That's our communication with the Lord. You know, right now, when you think about prayer, prayer is a tool that is so underutilized in the church. Um, prayer gatherings are the least attended event, typically, at a church. And um, we have to pray. We have to cry out to the Lord. There's no, you know, you don't have to do it in some, you know, specific way. You just have to speak to the Lord wholeheartedly. And the Lord knows what's on our hearts. We just have to ask him. And then fourthly, we also have um, fellowship, right? We have sisters and brothers in Christ that can help us in difficult times because we can't run this race alone. It's extremely difficult to run this race alone. We need each other. And that fellowship is very important. If you tap into those four things, the enemy is going to have a really hard time with you because you're going to have the ability to submit to God. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be some days that are harder, harder than others. Believe me, I know this is easier said than done, but we have all that we need. That way, we can escape those tactics, those tactics of, the, of the enemy. And what we're going to see here in the next several verses is that Daniel and his friends, they do exactly that. They don't compromise. Even though this vicious, brutal king... Um, has brought all of these, these things upon them. So if you look here, beginning in verse 8, um, and I'll go ahead and read through, uh, let me read through verse 16, and then we'll, we'll break this down a little bit. It says there, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king, who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, of 10 days rather, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them um, vegetables. All right, so very interesting here. Um, what we see, what we can, you know, conclude here is Daniel was very, very determined um, not to defile himself as well as his friends. It was set upon his heart that he would not compromise. He would not go against um, the Lord because of this, this earthly ruler, King Nebuchadnezzar. And um, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, why, why is he making such a big deal, right? Like, it's just food. You know, just eat the food. It'll be okay. Well, the truth of the matter is, we can only grow in our intimacy with the Lord. We can only grow in the Lord when we are faithful, even in the little things. 
Because sometimes we don't think those little things are important, but to the Lord, those little things are extremely important. And um, our relationship with the Lord should touch every aspect or every part um, of our lives. And then going back to this food that, you know, Daniel didn't want to eat because he didn't want to defile himself. If you remember, the root of sin goes back to the Garden of Eden, right? And, you know, remember there, forbidden food was eaten, which led to all of this chaos that we're living in now, right? So, you know, Daniel was determined in his heart not to defile himself and to go against, um, and the Lord, go against the Lord. And when you think about the food, for example, you know, this was a Babylonian king. Um, obviously, the food was not going to be kosher, right? And in that time, you know, remember the standards that Daniel and his friends had um, were very high, right, from this traditional Jewish law. They had to follow those things. And eating the king's food likely would defile them in the sense that it was not kosher. The food was probably also um, sacrificed to idols and to false gods. And then to top it off, eating the king's food in a way showed fellowship with them and with this new Babylonian culture or cultural system. Additionally, the wine was probably sacrificed to idols and, um, and false gods. And, you know, Daniel, he probably knew that there, were, there could be some serious consequences going against the king. And, um, you know, after all, it was a king who had ordered this menu, right? And when you think about King Nebuchadnezzar, this guy was pretty capable of some great cruelty. If you remember, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39, um, if you remember there, he murdered the sons of King Zedekiah of Judah. And if you remember, he murdered them in front of him before gouging his eyes out. So the last thing that king saw were his sons being murdered. And this was all in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So this guy was capable of some great cruelty. And as you can imagine, um, you know, Daniel was aware of this. But in the case of Daniel, he feared God more than he feared King Nebuchadnezzar. And the word of God tells us, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 28, there it says, Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the only person we need to fear is the Lord. Not man, not anything that is of this world, um, because only the Lord is the one who can um, throw us, to hell or, or send us to heaven, right? Um, no one can do that. They can kill us physically, but they can't kill us spiritually in a sense. All right, so his faith in God, in God's word, that is Daniel, it resulted in obedience. So then what the word of God tells us here is that he actually asked the chief eunuch, right? Permission not to defile himself. And I love this because when you, when you think about the way Daniel d does this, right? Daniel, um, he could have gone on a hunger strike and made a scene, right? But rather, he goes to the chief eunuch and politely asks him, hey, um, you know, I don't want to defile myself, right? And then he asks the, the, the um, it, it was the officer that was overseeing them to test them, right, for 10 days. Um, but he didn't, like, go on this protest or make a scene. You know, you think about that in the world today, and, like, people in their sin, they want to be so loud about it, like they want to protest about it, they want to influence you with it, and, and um, Daniel just wanted to obey God, simply wanted to obey God, and he did it in a very calm and, and quiet way, right? And, um, and we should have the same heart as Daniel, to just want to obey God and not make a scene. And then notice, because of his obedience to the Lord, um, God actually grants him kindness and compassion from this, this eunuch, right? Um, however, the guard that the eunuch had assigned to watch over Daniel and his friends, he was very fearful of what could happen to him if they started to lose weight and look maybe skinnier than the other young men that were eating the king's food. And, you know, this, this guard probably knew Nebuchadnezzar's capability of, um, of cruelty. So he was afraid. And that's when Daniel challenged him. He said, hey, test us for 10 days, right? 
And, um, and then after those 10 days, we can go from there. And, um, you know, they do this for 10 days. And, you know, in, in my mind, you know, Daniel doing this, it really shows us a young man that has some really, really great faith. Faith so great that he's willing to take this big risk, right, of a physical harm from King Nebuchadnezzar. But what a beautiful place to be in the Lord. As you have so much faith and confidence in the decisions that God puts on your heart to make, that you have peace. And that's such a cool and beautiful place to be. And, you know, Pastor Angel talked a little bit about this last week. He talked about Abraham and he talked about Isaac. And, you know, in the book of Genesis, remember that, that, that time when the Lord had tested Abraham and had asked him to sacrifice his only son, that is the son of promise, which was Isaac, and, and Abraham's willingness to do it. Because of that, the Lord counted it as righteousness and, and considered and even called Abraham um, a friend. And that is such a beautiful thing. And Daniel, in a sense, is, is doing the same thing here. He's obedient to the Lord. He's going to do this thing, and he trusts that the Lord's going to carry him um, through that circumstance. So notice that at the very end of that section there, that after 10 days, that Daniel and his friends, they actually looked healthier, right? They looked healthier than the other young men that had defiled themselves. Um, and, you know, this, so this is not an encouragement to, you know, become a vegetarian necessarily. Um, what we want to understand here is that because of their obedience to God, he provided love and protection that made them healthier and, and, and stronger, right? And, and, and thank God for that because um, I like steaks and I like carne asada. I have to eat my meat. So, um, you know, it's not just because you're a vegetarian that the Lord's going to bless you, but rather your obedience to the Lord is what's going to bless you, okay? Um, so like Daniel, the Lord, and, and I'm sure he's done this in your life as well, he will make you stronger Maybe not physically necessarily, but spiritually, he will make you stronger. And that's, that's very important. All right, so the last thing we want to look at here is that because of their obedience to the Lord, that God blessed Daniel and his friends, and he protected them as well. So um, I think I left off on 17. So yes, beginning in verse 17, it says, God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time um, that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend uh, the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his king entire kingdom. Um, Daniel remained there until the year of King um, Cyrus. So very, very interesting here. Um, the blessings that resulted from obedience um, to the Lord. And I like to think of obedience as like the spout where the blessings pour out, right? Um, Daniel had faith in God's word, and that's what led to Daniel's obedience to God's word. And we as believers, just like Daniel, we have to keep God's word. And the way we keep God's word, I truly believe, is if we love the Lord. And if we love him, we're going to keep his words. And in fact, if you look in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, for example, here Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He's telling them about the helper, the promise, speaking of the power in the person of the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And if we love him, we're going to keep his commands, right? We're going to keep his word. And we have to love the Lord more than we love the world, than we love pleasure, than we love the sin in our lives, right? Because we will sin every single day. We're going to blow it every day because we're not, we're still in the flesh. We're not face to face with the Lord. And we have to love the Lord more than those things in our lives that separate us from the Lord. And that's how we keep his word is by loving him more than those things. And then when we keep the Lord's word, 
he'll bless us. For example, if you look in the Gospel of Luke, there in the 11th chapter, if you remember there, Jesus was in the middle of his earthly ministry. He was preaching, he was healing people, he was performing miracles, he was on fire. People were following him, people were hating him. He was, it was amazing what he was doing. And a woman from the crowd raises her voice to Jesus and she says to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. But then Jesus says, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So we're going to be blessed, not only by hearing God's word, by keeping God's word. And that's what we need to do. We need to love him enough to keep it. And then when we keep it, we are blessed. But not only are we just blessed, but we're going to be blessed in everything that we do. James 1, verses 23 through 25 tells us, Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what, um, in what he does. So because Daniel and his friends kept the word of God, they were obedient and they did not compromise. And they turned to the ways, and they did not turn rather to the ways of the world, right? That Babylonian culture. And what we see here is that because of this, the Lord blessed them in the following ways, right? He gave them knowledge and understanding. Daniel understood visions and dreams of every kind. And then it says here that none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were 10 times better than the magicians and the mediums of his entire kingdom because they were blessed by the Lord. And then notice here that Daniel remains there until, um, the, until King Cyrus, which is around the 530-ish BC. Um, but what's beautiful here is that these young men, Daniel and his friends, they were immersed in this Babylonian culture, the literature, the religion, everything, but yet they remained faithful to God. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because, um, I don't know if you guys have been swimming lately, but it's like, um, if you have a ball in the pool and you push the ball into the water, right? Like you immerse the ball down into the water. That's exactly what happened to Daniel and his friends. They were immersed into this Babylonian culture. But the ball has air in it, right? Which means it's less dense than the water. So if you let go of the ball, the ball shoots up out of the water. And that's exactly what happened with Daniel and his friends, right? Because of their faith in the word of God, because of their obedience to God, they were able to overcome that immersement into this Babylonian culture. And that's exactly what we need to do as, as believers. We need to be like that ball shooting out of the pool, right? You know, this world is immersing us, indoctrinating us, and we have to be above that because we're not um, of this world. We're in this world. All right, so in closing um, this morning, there were five things that we looked at, okay? The first thing we looked at was the indoctrination of King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So we have this brutal king who besieged Jehoiakim and Judah. They took the best of their items from the temple, where he took the best, right? And the best of the young, prominent men with the purpose of indoctrinating them turning them from their Hebrew culture and from the Lord and turning them to the ways of the Babylonians. That was Daniel and his three friends. The second thing we learned was that Daniel and his friends, they were young people. And scholars suggest they were like 13 to 17 years of age. And like I said, some of our church members are, are that age. And maybe if you're watching on the live stream, maybe you're that age, you're a young person. Don't ever underestimate your age or what the Lord's capable of doing. And in fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul writes there to young Timothy. He says, don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So just because you're young doesn't mean that God can't use you. 
as an example for, for older people, right? Because the truth of the matter is, Christian maturity doesn't come with a number that is your age. Rather, Christian maturity comes from where your heart is with the Lord and your obedience to the Lord. It's not how old you are. And certainly we saw this with Daniel and his friends. They were a great example um, to that region that was, in, that was engaging in idolatry and all these, these other awful things that didn't please the Lord. The third thing we looked at was that the king's orders, they defied God's orders, right? And, you know, right now, we live in a time that is extremely perilous in the world. You know, some people, some people say that the world is falling apart, but the truth of the matter is, biblically, the world is falling into place. And that's what we can confide in through the word of God. But yet, in the midst of all the chaos that we're facing every single day as believers, we, just like Daniel and his friends, we need to stay steadfast in the Lord and obedient to the Lord and not compromise, even when the world pushes us to the edge. We can't compromise. We have to live above that. And every single day when we go to school, when we go to work, when we are just out and about, the world is going to pressure us, try to indoctrinate us, to defy and go against God and go in the ways of the world. And right now we're facing... A lot of indoctrination, right? Gender indoctrination, race indoctrination, um, you know, um, a crisis of identity, all these things, the drugs, the alcohol, all these things that we're facing. We have to be careful and we have to keep praying for one another. And in my opinion, especially our young people, the young people are facing this. This generation is just, it's chaotic. It, it's a mess. And they, they have to be brighter than ever now um, in, in this time. Um, so what we need to do as believers is we have to stay in the word of God. That way we know where we stand when it comes to different topics and different issues that we're facing um, in the world. Because our, our identity is not in the world. Our identity is in Christ Jesus. And that's um, where we have to, to focus on. And the only way we're going to learn more about Christ is by reading the word of God because it points us to Jesus Christ. It talks to us. It shows us the life of Jesus Christ. The person you hang out the most with is the person you're going to become the most like. So we want to hang out. We want to spend most of our time with the Lord, don't we? We want to spend our time in his word, seeking him, desiring to be more like him. And in the midst of all this, um, we can do what Daniel and what his friends did, right? They didn't give in. The fourth thing we talked about was that Daniel and his friends did not compromise, right? They were obedient to the Lord's word. And once again, we're living in times where the culture is changing, things are changing, and, and people are like, well, because society is changing, the word of God needs to change too. But the truth of the matter is God's word doesn't need to change because God's word never changes, right? Psalm 119, there in the 89th verse, tells us that the word of God is eternal and it stands firm in heaven. The word of God will never change. Presenting the word of God changes, but not the meaning or the interpretation of the word of God, that will always stay the same. We can't change it to fit the times or to fit any type of motive or any type of agenda that is man-made. We have to be very careful. The author of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, because remember in the Gospel of John, it tells us there in the first uh, verse, chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And then, of course, the Word became flesh, which was Jesus, or is Jesus. Um, that's a little bit later in that, in that uh, chapter there. But the Word of God is God. God never changes, so therefore the Word will never change. And that's why we can't compromise. We have to hold fast to exactly what the Word says. And when we have that faith like Daniel in the word of God, the decisions we make, um, we, can have, we can have confidence in, in those things. Because how are we supposed to win the world for Christ if we look and we act exactly like the world does, right? We have to be careful. And then lastly, what we talked about was that out of obedience, God protected and blessed Daniel and his friends. We learned that Daniel and his friends... <clears throat> They listened to their inner conviction and overcame the pressure on the outside. And God honored them for that obedience. Okay. 
And he'll do the same for you, and he'll do the same for me, right? When we, when we honor the Lord, he will honor us as well. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. And with everything we talked about this morning, and everything that you've learned or have been taught through the Word of God, we have everything that we need. We, can, we have the confidence that we need to make the right decision in the eyes of the Lord. And when things get tough around us, um, we can just confide in that. I read a quote the other day that says, man's laws cannot make moral what God has declared immoral. Even if sin is legalized, it's still a sin in the eyes of God. So we have to be careful. And then I'll close with this from Acts chapter 5. This is something that we talked about last week um, with the youth group. You know, We're going through the book of Acts. But there, if you remember, in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles, they were performing signs and wonders by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And they were teaching in the name of the Lord. And of course, the, the religious leaders in that time, they were becoming angry and upset. And they, they um, eventually threw them in prison and then brought them to trial. And they told them they were ordered not to teach in the name of the Lord. And then Peter responds, beginning in verse 29 there of Acts chapter 5. He says, we must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you have murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man in his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So just like Peter and these apostles and Daniel and his friends and the many countless saints before us, let us continue steadfastly in the Lord and not compromising even when the world around us is pressuring us or caving in on us. Amen. Well, if you're watching uh, via the live stream or maybe even here in person and, um, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and maybe this morning you're tired of wrestling with the indoctrination of this world and um, the fact that this world is not satisfying. The only thing that satisfies is the Lord and you're tired of that. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. Um, if that's you, um, I ask that we would just close our eyes and bow our heads and, um, and, and repeat this prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this morning, Lord. And, and this morning, Lord, I, um, we want to declare your Son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. This morning, Lord, I, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus was buried. And I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize that I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. And please fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, um, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And as always, um, I can assure you that there is a celebration going on in heaven, or in heaven rather, on, on your behalf. And um, if this is uh, something that you've done this morning and maybe you have any questions or maybe your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, anything like that, please just reach out to us here at the church, or you can come visit us. We meet every uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for worship and for uh, Bible study. Um, our building is located at the intersection of Gateway South and, um, and Hondo Pass here in uh, Northeast El Paso. And um, we pray that you have a blessed week. Um, we love you, and um, we're here for you if you need anything. So have a blessed week, and uh, we'll see you. we'll see you soon.